see it coming The story of redemption Started in a manger Ended in an empty grave and welcome to worship this morning at Overeisel Reformed Church. You see a little blue card in front of you. We would love to have you fill that out if you're a visitor with us this morning. We're really glad that you're here. You can fill that out and put it on the information table and take a cup or a tumbler. And uh, we'd love to get, you, to get, get to know you more better. You can see that we have changed to Christmas and to winter. We've gotten rid of all of the gourds and the pumpkins and things down there. And it probably was time for that. And now we've moved on. This is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent means a coming or an arrival. Or another way to describe it is an expectant waiting. And that's what we're entering into this morning. As we head toward Christmas, we anticipate the arrival of the baby Jesus, and today is the first Sunday of that. And so, as we change things over from one season to another, so we anticipate the waiting and the coming of the baby Jesus. So let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, as we gather here this morning for this first Sunday of Advent, we begin the expectant waiting of the baby Jesus. And Lord, we just pray that you would work in our hearts and our lives in these next number of weeks to prepare us for the coming of the Messiah. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So as we have gathered here today, let's stand and greet one another. And following that, Kevin will lead us and the praise team will lead us into song. Let's stand and greet one another. One of the beautiful things about Advent is that, yes, we celebrate and anticipate the coming of Jesus and the celebration of his birth, but it's also meant to remind us to look forward to the day when Christ will come again. And we wait in great expectation for that day. These next two songs are songs of Advent as we wait for the second coming of our Savior. Come thou found. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, pour for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. I was lost, I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set. 
six.
great and almighty God, that is our prayer, that you will be here in this place through your spirit, and that you will come soon in all of your glory, your splendor, and your majesty. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This time we have the opportunity to uh, start Advent off with an Advent reading, so you can be seated. It's Christmas again, year after year. We celebrate through the same traditions. As we decorate the houses, give gifts, sing Christmas songs, and gather with friends and family. It can be easy to forget the reason between our celebrations. It can be hard to see Christmas with our new eyes. But that Christmas was different. It was met with excitement. The people of Israel had been waiting for a savior for hundreds of years. Finally, nine months before his birth, an angel breaks in the silence and announces, the wait is over because as God had promised through Isaiah years before, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. We light this first candle of Advent as a reminder of God's fulfilled promise that a light would come into the world. Let's, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your gift of Jesus in that the wait is over. Help us to anticipate Christmas Day as the Israelites did for so many years long ago. Help us to remember the true gift of Christmas is Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for your persistence. That's great. Don't give up. Well, we head into the Advent season. And we think about Jesus Christ coming. And as Kevin said, we also think about that second coming. And we anticipate that as well. And we don't know when that will happen. But we wait for it. So as we do that, let's go to our God in prayer. Lord, Psalm 25 says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. 
Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Lord, teach us your ways. Make us to know your ways. Not only to know them, but to put them into practice. To do what you would have us to do. And Lord, your word says that you lead the humble. That's all we need to be, Lord. We just need to be humble. We need to do the best that we can and offer it up to you as a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. And Lord, we do that this morning. And as we gather here together, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for the baby Jesus Christ who came down to earth, who humbled himself and came down to earth for us and for our salvation. Lord, it is too great for us to fathom that. It is too great for us to fully understand that but we thank you for it. And we thank you that you sent your son to this world to save this world, not to condemn this world, but to save this world. And we lift up those this morning who are in need of your healing touch. We have heard this past few days again that Jan Humpkis is back in Zealand Hospital with some stroke symptoms. And Lord, we just lift her up this morning. Just pray for you to be present with her and to touch her with your healing hand. We pray for all those listed in the bulletin. And we pray for all those who are known to people gathered here this morning that are not listed in the bulletin, but yet you know the concerns of our hearts and you hear them and you see them and you listen to them this morning. There may be things so deep within us that we can't even put it into words. We are sorry for things we have done or sorry for things that we have not done in this past week. We have come through these days of thanksgiving and we have been blessed and we have so much to be thankful for but yet sometimes we still complain and we still bicker and we argue and we get caught up within ourselves. Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us and help us to know and to experience your healing touch so that we may go forth from here today into this week and into this, these coming weeks knowing that we anticipate Christmas Day and the coming of Jesus as a baby. Help us to live into that this month. Help us to live into all that you have done for us and to live with hearts of gratitude and thankfulness and anticipation of what is coming. Thank you for this opportunity to gather here this morning 
to worship together as a family here at Overeisel and just be with us as we go out from here. And may we continue to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Every heart longing for our king, as we just sang. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let's stand to sing hymn number 124, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Amen and amen to our God and to our worship this morning. It's great to be here with you as we begin our Advent journey to Christmas and hear God speak to us from the very Bible, the very Word of God. And this morning we begin a series of sermons, messages on the wonderful season and truth of Advent and the coming of Jesus Christ. And we begin this morning in the Gospel of Luke. Would you turn in your Bible to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and we will read verses 26 through 38. Luke 1 26 through 38. And I encourage you to keep your Bible open during the message so you can uh, follow along. Would you pray with me, please? Silent night. Holy night. All is calm, all is bright. Lord Jesus, we pray that in this world of sin and sorrow and sadness, that not only today's worship and message, but over the next month, you would be pleased to speak to our hearts all over again in a fresh way. We pray that this word would be a living word for all of our hearts this morning. Please send your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent 
from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed or engaged, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is God's word. Welcome to Advent. This time of waiting, expecting, and looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. Over the next several weeks, my prayer and hope is that together we will experience both Advent, the promise of the coming of Christ, and the celebration of Christ's coming, as though we've heard it for the first time. I know that's impossible humanly, but as you just heard, with God all things are possible. And maybe throughout the weeks to come, there will be thoughts and ideas that surprise you, awaken you, and change you as you hear this story again like never before. And so we're going to seek to discover the Christmas story all over again. Simple messages, simple explanations, just waiting on the Lord to touch and transform us. And our first message of six is this. Discover Mary's Christmas announcement all over again. Have you heard it? Do you know it? It's found right here in Luke 1, verses 26 through 28. Every now and then when you watch TV, 
there'll be a stoppage. And you'll hear the message or announcement, this is a message of the emergency broadcasting system. And for the next 30 seconds, they'll test their system. Then it breaks through the show or the program you're watching. When I was in school, every morning, the principal or someone would come over the loudspeaker and say, good morning, students. Here are the announcements for the day. Well, this morning, you're going to hear the announcement of the ages. Verses 26 and 27 open by telling us that when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, Gabriel was sent from God to Galilee and to a city called Nazareth. And then he says in verse 27 two times, to a virgin betrothed, and that meant they were engaged, and to break the engagement in Jewish custom, they would have to divorce. That's how binding the betrothal period was. To a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And there you have the beginning of Advent. In Mary's Advent, her waiting, and our Advent, and our waiting, begin with an announcement. And the announcement you are about to hear is not from the emergency broadcasting station. The announcement you are about to hear is not from a vice principal or the principal of a school. This is the announcement of God breaking into human history. And so right now I want to share with you three words. Ruler, miracle, and response. Let's say these three words together. Ruler, miracle, and response. One more time. Ruler, miracle, and response. This is the announcement of all announcements, as you're about to learn. Mary's Christmas announcement is, first of all, an announcement about a ruler, it's all about a ruler. And I know I'm looking into the faces and lives of people who generally have heard this before. But maybe there's someone listening in who hasn't heard this announcement about the ruler. We want to look at this announcement about a ruler a little bit. In verse 28... After Luke tells us that the angel Gabriel arrived, Gabriel begins with the greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Verse 29 tells us that Mary was greatly troubled, trying to figure out what this greeting might be. I can't fathom a young girl in her mid to late teens, maybe her early 20s, and all of a sudden an angel appears. And she's trying to figure out what it's all about as she was minding her own business, if you will. Verse 30 tells us that the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. So the young virgin was told not to be afraid of Gabriel, the angel that God sent. Because in God's wonderful, mysterious economy, you have found favor, grace, grace. Grace, Mary. So there's nothing to fear. And then the announcement actually begins. Let's look at these three verses. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign or rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. What is this announcement all about? It's about a ruler. 
But what do we learn about this ruler? When elections are taking place in Western democracies like the United States, all the candidates for office tout, put forth their credentials. And you see mailings, and you see more mailings. And they debate on television. And socialist countries, or certainly communist countries, you don't have quite that much say in matters, if any at all. Because rulers are kind of appointed in different ways. But here we're told about this ruler's credentials from God in the Bible. And what do we know about this ruler? Well, first of all, we know that this ruler will be conceived in the womb of a virgin named Mary. That's so clear from the text. Mary's virginity, Mary's lack of encounter with a male, it's very clear in the text. She was a virgin through and through. And the angel comes and says that you will conceive in your womb a son. So the virgin will conceive in her womb a male, a boy. Gabriel knew the difference. And so should you. We know secondly that the son conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary was to be named Jesus, which means he saves. Thirdly, we know that this ruler will also be, according to verse 32, the son of the Most High. And so now you have this, this mystery emerging. A virgin will have a baby boy. We got that in some measure. But this virgin will also bear a child called Jesus who will also be the son of the Most High. Most High is a phrase... A couple of words used often in the Old Testament. Most high God. Not Baal. Not Ra, the God of the Egyptians, the sun God. Not the gods of Babylon or the gods of Assyria. But our God is God most high. Say the Israelites. And now we're told Mary's going to bear a son called the son of the Most High. We also know that God will give to him the throne of his father David, which means this baby named Jesus will grow up to be a man, and he will inherit and sit on the throne of King David, and he will also rule over the house of Jacob, our text says, in verse 33, forever, and his kingdom will have no end. There will be no end to his kingdom. So this is a, a composite picture of the ruler. Mary is told she will bear and give to the world. And what I want you to think about with me for a couple of minutes is this. The time has come for you to discover, maybe for the first time, or to discover again, God's ruler. God's ruler. Through this Advent and Christmas season, let me share some thoughts with you about the ruler we've read about. It's very obvious from the text that this is a promised ruler. A promised ruler. When you look at all the details that Gabriel spoke to Mary, Gabriel is bringing together a collection of thoughts 
and Old Testament scripture passages and ideas and truths that filled the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. It's all over the place. And Gabriel comes with the, the leading pieces of Old Testament promise concerning the Messiah. That's what Gabriel is saying to Mary. The Messiah is coming. 400 years of silence, no word from God. And he breaks through, he intrudes into this moment and says the Messiah is coming. This is a compilation of Old Testament teaching on the promise of the Messiah. This ruler is promised by God to come. Second of all, this is a perfect ruler. You'll notice that he's the son of the Most High and will be conceived in the womb of the virgin and be called her son. What's going on here? You're seeing both his human flesh and blood and his divine lineage, ancestry. And so what's beginning to emerge as the dawn of the New Testament age arises is that this, this ruler is going to be both God and man at the same time. Not just God, not just a human being, but a human being like us, but God unlike us. Jesus is God-man, the God-man, a perfect ruler, a promised ruler. He's also the ruler of this coming paradise. Notice at the end of verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. I'd love to unfold all the truth behind these statements. It's just so rich. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. I want you to hear that. This coming kingdom that this ruler will oversee, will never have an end. That's all over the Old Testament as well. Daniel talks about his kingdom and dominion will reign forever and ever. And on and on it goes. And what you're hearing is that Gabriel, God through Gabriel, is telling Mary in this great announcement that this ruler is the promised Messiah, the perfect Messiah, and the Messiah or king who has and will oversee paradise forever and ever, a kingdom that will never end. That's absolutely breathtaking. Many of you have seen the highly acclaimed motion picture called The Lion King. And in that movie, the Lion King at first is Musafa, the great king. And he has a little, little lion cub. And a baboon creature holds the baboon or holds the little Simba up for all the creatures to see. And the story begins. And the father lion teaches his little cub all about the circle of life. And they stand on the edge of the cliff and he says, how much space, how much of this land is ours, Dad? And he says, As wherever you can see the light touching the land, it's ours. Well, this king dies, and little Simba runs away. And he arrives in a beautiful, lush, green land where he meets a, a warthog and I think a meerkat. And they begin talking to him about where he's from, and he begins talking to them about the circle of life. And they say, oh, there's no such thing as a circle of life. Life is linear. It just keeps going and going, and you got to do the best you can. And the little Simba cub, who's supposed to be the Lion King someday, says, oh, really? 
And they go back and forth, and finally he concedes and says, yes, there's no circle of life. And then he goes back, becomes the ruler, and the whole notion of the circle of life continues. And I'm here to tell you this morning that tens of millions of people have seen this. And the Bible you just heard this morning blows to smithereens the circle of life. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a circle of life that's unbiblical. He was telling his son that you die and then you come back in another form and another form and another form. And the circle of life is contradicting biblical teaching. I'm sure many of you noticed that when you watch the movie. <laughs> There's not a circle. There's a beginning. And there's an end point. There's a beginning point to creation. There's an end point to this creation. His kingdom will last forever. The kingdom of our Lord. God created in the beginning the heavens and the earth. Christians do not believe in the recycling of history, any type of reincarnation circle. When you die, you don't come back as a non-human entity. The moment your heart breathes, it is appointed unto you to be judged by God. And then your eternal state will be determined. You understand this, don't you? You understand this biblically. We're not reincarnated. The way it is now will not be the way it always is. We've heard this already in singing and in prayers and in sharing. This is what is clearly implied. He will reign forever over the house of Jacob and is of his kingdom there will be no end. This is the kingdom of God. And when Christ returns, you are either in the kingdom or you are out of the kingdom. Come thou long expected Jesus. He's a promised ruler. He's a perfect ruler. It's a, a paradise over which he will rule forever with no end. And it's, he's a ruler of hearts. He's a ruler of hearts. So in this day, they all thought the Messiah would come, and together with their swords and their shields, they would beat up the Romans. But he's a king of the heart. He, that, that great battle is coming when he comes the second time, and it'll be over before it even begins. But right now, Christ wants to rule over your heart, to take over your heart. You see, the coming of this child is an intrusion into Mary's womb. Her life is now different. It's an intrusion into the world. And the coming of Christ into the world, we call it incarnation. That's a big theological word. It simply means the birth of the Son of God. That is the great intrusion of God into this world. And whether you believe it or not, you are affected by it. Before Christ, B.C., after death, A.D., Christ is the center of everything that exists. And maybe you're an unbeliever. Maybe you're a skeptic. Jesus affects you. The very fact that you reject Jesus, he's affecting you. Nobody can get away from Jesus, the Son of God. So this announcement is an announcement of a coming ruler who will bring to pass the eternal kingdom of God. Number two, Mary's Christmas announcement after the word ruler is the word miracle. It's an announcement about a miracle. Now let's look at this, beginning with verse 34. Now, time out. I, I don't know if you believe in miracles, but they're all over the Bible. And a miracle is a supernatural intrusion of God into the natural order of things. He does something different. He suspends the natural order to accomplish a great purpose. The Old Testament has lots of miracles. The New Testament has many miracles as well. What you are about to read is, is the miracle of miracles. Verse 34, and Mary said to the angel, 
Notice this. How will this be? Since I am a virgin. In the literal Greek, you'll see in your Bible there, it says, since I do not know a man. No, no human agency here. So Mary's how can this be is not a doubt. It is not a question of skepticism. Like what? It's not going to happen. Like Zechariah, when he was told his wife would bear, that's what he was, he, did, he disbelieved it. So he was silent for those, those months. Mary doesn't, dis- she believes, but she's just curious. How's this going to be? I'm a virgin. And notice what the angel says. Now, if you've never highlighted or circled 35 in your Bible, this is the day to do it. Underline it, asterisk it, memorize it. This is the verse of verses. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. And in verse 7, 37, the angel says, For nothing will be impossible with God. So, I want to share with you that it's not only time for you to discover or rediscover again the Christmas ruler, Jesus Christ. But it's also time for you to discover or rediscover again the Holy Spirit conception of the Son of God in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The miracle of Jesus' conception. In Psalm 104, verse 30, the Bible says, When God sends forth his Spirit, creatures are created. It is the Spirit who gives life. And you'll remember in Genesis chapter 1, the very second verse of the whole Bible that says, And the Spirit of God was hovering, hovering over the waters of the earth, brooding over the waters of the earth. Here we're told the Spirit of God is going to overshadow, overshadow Mary, and within her womb conceive the Son of God. Foretold in Isaiah 7, 14. Now let me give you some thoughts about this miracle. Number one, it was a very quiet miracle. Very quiet. We live in such a noisy world today. Distractions everywhere. Our ears and our minds and our hearts are filled with noise, noise, noise. People are so accustomed to noise that if the radio or television isn't on in their room or their hospital room or somewhere or in their automobile, they... they, They go crazy. They have to have some kind of noise. Listen, silence is a a beautiful thing. Be still and know that I am. You need some silence in your life. This was a very quiet miracle. The Holy Spirit just overshadowed Mary. And for nine months... The Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, in utero, grew and grew and grew. Preserved from Mary's sin, preserved from the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and grew and grew. And nine months later, and we'll look at this in a few weeks, nine months later, The Son of God was born into this world. And then, 30 years later, he was baptized by John, and he began his ministry of healing and preaching the kingdom of God as a Jewish rabbi. But in ways all the Jewish rabbis of his day or before him and after him couldn't teach. And then after those three years, he was crucified. So from nine months, 
there was 30 years, and at age 30, he began to preach and teach, and three years later, he was crucified on a cross, and he died. He's human after all. You prick him, he bleeds. You stab him, he dies. Something sad happens, he cries. That's Jesus. And he's dead. And then three days later, he rises from the dead, called the resurrection in the Christian church. And then 40 days later, he ascends up to heaven and sits at the Father's right hand. And then some day later, he's coming back. He's coming back. And the moment Jesus sat down at the Father's right hand, God took the hourglass of heaven filled with the exact number of grains of heavenly sand and he turned it upside down. And all the sand started going through the little funnel until his son comes a second time. And I would suggest to you that the sands in the hourglass of time are rapidly going through the, through the funnel right now. And there's a few left. God started his divine clock when Jesus sat down. It was a very quiet miracle. And then it burst onto the scene. It was an unexpected miracle. Nobody expected the Messiah of the Jews to be born of a virgin, to be conceived of the Holy Spirit, and to be the divine Son of God, which all of you who are listening right now know as you're thinking through this, you're saying all this means that he pre-existed his birth. And the Bible is saying, you bet. He pre-existed his birth because he is God from all eternity. It was an unexpected miracle. It was an unrepeatable miracle. I, I just suggest to you that this is the greatest miracle in the history of time and space. Greater than the creation of the heavens and earth. Greater than the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You say, how can that be? Well, listen, if God can become a man while remaining God, no less divine, no less God, and yet at the same time a human, 100% divine, 100% human, two natures in a single person, if God can do that, and he did do that, then all the other miracles fall into place. I believe he can walk on water. I believe he can raise Lazarus from the dead. I believe he can be raised from the dead, and on and on it goes. The incarnation is the foundation. This is the foundation of all that comes in the life of Jesus. That's why verse 35 is what you want to circle and underline and ponder and meditate upon. It's an unrepeatable miracle. It's a worldwide miracle. Nations to this day confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. He came into this world to call all religions, all philosophers, all those with wrong beliefs about life back to reality. God created. Jesus died and rose. And it's a miracle for you. What, what I like about this is that Mary didn't understand everything. And you don't have to understand everything to believe. You don't. Neither do I. We don't have to understand this. This isn't meant to be put under a microscope and through science and learning, try to figure out all. No. You just read what the Bible says. You can't go into the depths of this. That's for eternity. Paul says that he preaches the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. These riches are so unsearchable. We search as much as we can. And then we say, God be praised. Third and lastly, this, this Christmas announcement to Mary is an announcement of a ruler. It's an announcement about a miracle. But now in verse 38, we see one more thing. 
It's an announcement about a response. A response. Let's look at verse 38 together. And Mary said, so this is, this is what Mary is going to respond with. And Mary said, behold, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So, clearly God is calling her to respond in some way. And I want to close in the next few minutes by thinking with you about this response. There's two aspects to Mary's response. Wonder and surrender. Wonder and surrender. Look at the word behold. So here's Mary now. She has just been told she's going to conceive the Son of God. Nothing's impossible. And she says to the angel and, of course, to God, Behold. What does the word behold mean? What is she saying? Like, look at something? No, no. Maybe a little bit of, look at me, I'm going to surrender to the Lord. But behold is, is wonder. Behold is inward adoration of God. When you behold God, you adore him from the inside. He is the one you adore and love because Christ died. He, he forgives sin. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And there has to be wonder in your life this Christmas. Because if there's not wonder, you're missing Christmas. Mary goes, behold, she's adoring this news. She's adoring Jesus Christ. She's adoring, if you will, from the story, I think we're permitted to say this, the doctrine of the Trinity is not yet fully known, but she's adoring the truth that the Most High God the Father, will conceive in her womb by the Holy Spirit, the Son. And there's this emerging adoration that she will probably fully understand better before she dies. That she just says, God, I behold you. I'm silenced, but I behold you in awesome wonder. So that, that's one response God wants from you this Christmas, just to behold the Lord in all his majesty. But there's another one, and this is, this is the dominant note of the text, verse 38. It's the response of surrender. And this is where I want to meddle with your life a little bit right now. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Do you hear what she's saying? Mary is saying nothing less, nothing less than this. I surrender. I had my plans. Now I have your plans for my life. I was thinking like this and going in this direction. But now I'm thinking your thoughts after you and going in your direction. Surrender is allowing God to take you and do what he wants to do with your life. She surrendered. Maybe we can look at surrender. A couple examples. Surrender to the Lord Jesus is like a puzzle piece. Have you ever noticed when kids are four or five years old, their parents may get them or friends or relatives may get them one of those chunky puzzles with four or five pieces. And on the top of the chunky puzzle piece is a little peg. And they just try to fit it into the puzzle area. And with four or five pieces of the puzzle, they can 
They can do that, and it's kind of fun to see them develop that ability. But then as they get older, as we get older, we, we take a shot at a 50-piece puzzle, and then maybe a 250-piece puzzle, and then someday, maybe this Christmas, some of you are puzzle people. I'm not. We have a family of puzzle people. I don't do it too much because I always think there's a puzzle piece missing from the whole thing. But then you get to this 500-piece puzzle, and you get it on a table, And then, when you think you're the king or queen kahuna, you go for the 1,000-piece puzzle. And it happens over days and weeks, and finally you get it. And when you take that last piece of the puzzle, and you put it into place, you say, yeah, what a picture. Jesus Christ is the last piece of your life's puzzle. And until you put Jesus Christ in place and surrender to him, your life will be empty. It won't be all God wants it to be. In fact, you will still be in your sin if you don't believe in him. And if you die without him, you will perish. Christ is the last puzzle piece. There were 10,000 puzzle pieces in the Old Testament. And now God brings the final puzzle piece of Jesus and he says to the Holy Spirit, conceive in her womb. And the moment the Son of God was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the final puzzle piece of history was in place. He is the interpreter of history. He is the beginning of history, the end of history. And he's that for your life if you surrender to him. Surrender is saying, Jesus, I'm yours. And whatever you want for my life, I'm yours. That is the puzzle piece some of you are missing right now. You've never done that. Surrender to Jesus Christ. First, as a non-Christian, believe in him. And second, as a Christian, surrender on a regular basis so you know you're on track with Jesus in terms of what he wants to do with your life. Second, the, the response of surrender is not only like a puzzle piece, it's like a, a musical crescendo. What's a crescendo? Well, listen, a crescendo is, and I quote, the loudest point reached in a gradually increasing sound. Or the highest point reached in a progressive increase of intensity. You see, the announcement to Mary that she would bear the Son of God is the crescendo. It has reached its apex, its peak of 2,000 years and more of Old Testament biblical history that was announcing the coming of the Messiah. In fact, it goes back to the Garden of Eden when God preached to Satan in a serpent costume, if you will, and said one day Eve's baby is going to crush your head. And God was referring all the way to the baby of Mary who would crush the head of the serpent on the cross of Calvary. And so the coming of Christ was the culmination of centuries of waiting And what I am saying to you today is to surrender to Jesus Christ is the music of the soul. There's no more beautiful music in the whole wide world than the music of surrender. And guess what? You don't have to be a baritone or an alto or a soprano. You don't even have to know how to sing. We're talking about the music of the soul, which is surrender. You don't have to play the piccolo or the pipe organ, as wonderful as that is, and as much as we appreciate it. Surrender is music. It's both the last puzzle piece and the music of the human heart. It touches the mind, the will. You say, have I surrendered to Jesus Christ? Here's a simple test. This is a a basic test. If you've surrendered to Jesus Christ, he leads your mind and your thinking. He leads your will and your deciding. And he leads your heart and your loves and affections. And we're all in varying degrees there. 
But to be a Christian is to say, Jesus, I surrender my mind to you, my heart or my affections to you, my will and my decision processes to you. Be that last puzzle piece. Be that music of my soul. In other words, it's giving your life to Christ. And so, uh, the Christmas lights and trees are now shining. The candles are going to be lit. The concerts at school and colleges on TV will be held. But for you to enter into Christmas, this announcement has to be the final puzzle piece of your life and the music of your soul. Now you understand Advent and Christmas. Amen. Jesus, we love you. Come now. Come now and speak to us. Come now and help us. Come now, oh Jesus, and speak to us as though we're hearing this announcement all over again for the first time. As we sing about you now, may your spirit come and bless us. In your name we pray. Amen. Sunbeamers, you are dismissed. What child is this? Let's stand together. is indeed Christ the King. Go forth and live in the power and strength of the grace of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit this Advent season as you wait. Amen.